Okay, well, welcome to this week's Access Chat. We're really excited to have um, all of our founders here today, um, but also we are here with Francis West, and I'm very proud to call Francis a friend, and also very proud of Francis. Of, she's had so many accomplishments, it would be hard to name them all, but she is the first Chief Accessibility Officer, and we're very proud of IBM for taking this so seriously, and um, Francis is a global leader in the accessibility and disability inclusion space. And so we're just really, really excited to have Francis on today. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Neil, and he's going to start um, the questions. Thank you, Deborah, and welcome, Francis. Uh, I'm really excited also to have you on, mainly because I've been following IBM accessibility for a long time. Um, long before I started working for a, a big IT company, um, we would hear about the work that IBM was doing in the field of accessibility. I've been using things like IBM Via Voice since year 2000. So uh, it's great to have you on. So can you tell me a little bit about your, your journey to becoming Chief Accessibility Officer and, and, and what it entails? Sure. Um. So the journey actually is somewhat unexpected. Uh, I actually spent the a beginning and uh, uh, a most part of my IBM in sales organization. I was a uh, hired as assistance engineer and and worked with our customers directly. Um, and but from the very early on, uh, I was involved in providing solutions to our customers. Um, so the the usability of uh, IBM solution has always been the forefront of my interest and also experience. And uh, after I came back from an international assignment in China for three years, um, that kind of interest in, in solution-oriented um, technology offering became even more um, ingrained in my thinking. And uh, so, you know, I was actually managing IBM uh, Lotus uh, organization's um, business partner relations when this opportunity in IBM Research came up. Um, and uh, at the time, uh, frankly, I, I knew very little about accessibility. Uh, but the fact that it's an IBM Research opportunity, and IBM Research, you probably know, is one of the very few uh, private research um, uh, institution that's left in the, in the world and has a very, very um, uh, good reputation. So I thought, you know, uh, this will be a really interesting opportunity to get in, to work with our scientists around the world, and, uh, and work on an um, area that is uh, for the, you know, better uh, mankind. And, and my husband actually is in the human services area. So I have to say that this desire or, um, to be able to combine what I do as my day job and uh, to hopefully, you know, benefit the, uh, um, the, the humanity was one of those a rare combination opportunities. So, so I jumped in, into this job, you know, um, and, uh, and like I said, with very little uh, original knowledge about accessibility, but once I started working it, um, I just thought this is the greatest thing, um, not in terms of uh, personal satisfaction, and be able to work on something like this uh, that's so meaningful. Um, and also, it's a huge business opportunity area. And again, this goes back to my, my entire background has been sales and marketing. So I tend to look at it uh, very much from the business perspective. And I, I just feel like this is an area that's just waiting to be, um, waiting to be understood and waiting to be, um, uh, you know, uh, explored. So here I am, uh, 10, 12 years later, you know, still at it, and uh, every day, just, it really brings joy to my life. It's an, uh, I absolutely agree. Demographics are in the favor of the accessibility profession. Uh, we've, it's a huge market opportunity, and, and it's growing because of the, the aging population, et cetera. So let come back to aging slightly later in the, in the conversation. But... Um, what is it that that, um, that really IBM does? That wh why do you think it is that IBM sees accessibility as so important? Because many companies don't take such a, a, a sort of serious approach to accessibility as, as IBM has consistently over a number of years now. 
Um, what is it that, that, that sets IBM apart in this? I think actually, um, you know, like everything, um, it, it goes back to your kind of uh, one of your core um, um, perspective. Um, we, as you know, we're a technology company now. It's 104 years old now. And uh, as a technology company, you you are um, you're forced to innovate, right? I mean, if you don't innovate, you die. You don't you don't last 100 plus years without constantly reinventing yourself. So, at very early on, um, our um, you know our founder T.J. Watson uh, recognized that it, in order to carry uh, innovation, you got to have uh, talent. And if you want to have talent, you got to have diversity of talent because that's a lot of times. The, the kind of new talks or new perspective and new insight gets generated. So we had a very early on had this focus on uh, acquiring talent of different uh, backgrounds, different gender, different um, abilities. And uh, I think it's the talent focus that set IBM apart because when we hired our first uh, scientist who was blind in 1914, we realized that we actually have to innovate uh, technologies to enable uh, this uh, gentleman to be just as productive in the workforce. And over the years, you know, then we hired people who are deaf. Then, then we, we realized, well, we have to innovate again. And that's actually how Via Voice came about. Um, so as we go about doing accessibility, the, the, the foundation, foundational driver has always been about talent acquisition. Um, that's why I think it, it sets IBM apart and, uh, and, and frankly enable us to have a much deeper and also broader organization approach to it because it's considered part of our, um, part of our talent acquisition and also um, sustaining our innovation play. That's great. Deborah, I, I know you had a question. I, I do have a question, and um, the, the one thing, I have a lot of questions, and um, <laughs> but um, I, I would think the one that, you know, I, just a little history with me and IBM, when I decided to create Tech Access, and you know this, Francis, but um, a technology company that focused on ICT accessibility and employed people with disabilities, how we learned accessibility was we got out on IBM's website and we poured through all the information you had out there. So, and over the years, you know, we learned in other ways, but IBM was very, very important to, um, you know, the, our, our team learning about accessibility. And I know it's a work in process. I know it is. It's a work in process and progress. But the, I would, um, I'm going to ask you a different question, Neil. Um, the, the thing that I think the challenge that a lot of these large organizations have, and I've talked to a lot of the companies, uh, a lot of the heads of the companies, that if a company is even forward thinking like an IBM and has a head of accessibility, but it, it's all the moving parts. It's making sure everybody gets on board. All the, um, you know, how do you really truly blend accessibility into the core of what you do? I, I think IBM's done an amazing job with it and been used many, many times as of the way to set the bar high. But tell us a little bit about that, Francis, because I think a lot of the listeners, that's something that everybody's struggling with. Yeah, you can imagine uh, for a company like IBM Size, you know, we, we now have, you know, 350,000 plus employees and operate in 170 some countries and 24 seven operations. Um, the getting accessibility embedded, it, it is a huge uh, ongoing um, effort. Uh, there is never a day that you can say, I'm done, right? <laughs> there is one thing about accessibility, it never gets done. Um, so I think it's very important uh, for a company like um, large, larger enterprises versus a smaller uh, medium companies is that you've got to institutionalize accessibility through your company, what we call the governance and policy. It's almost like a, uh, like, like a government, right? I mean, it's a, in a way, it is a small government. And, um, and we actually, if you look at the first um, the two, three, I would say first five years of my um, working in the accessibility inside IBM, it's all about setting up the right governance model, right practices, 
and also finding the right stakeholders. Uh, we have an accessibility advisory board um, that um, that uh, our um, um, chair is chaired by uh, used to be by John Kelly, our uh, head of research, and uh, and we we try to have representations. Not we try we actually do have representation from all the corporate functions, such as uh, HR, legal, CIO office. But then we also make very sure that we have the very current uh, executive representation from the lines of business, from our software group, from our hardware group, from our solution team, from our um, emerging you know, technology team. And, uh, and by having the stakeholder involved and also have a very clearly articulated a governance model, um, if you put in the infrastructure to operationalize accessibility um, at the company level. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got to have a team of experts that can bring value to various parts of the uh, organization um, every time you engage them. We, we do actually more internal engagement selling sometimes actually we do externally. That's how you actually have to do it. Uh, you have to view accessibility as a living thing. And you have to feed it, you have to care it, and then you have to promote it uh, every single day. But Francis, I remember at, at one point, and I remember um, you said this, and it, it just rang so true for me. But there were, and, and so I'm, I'm probably not going to say it correctly, but the, I know that IBM was looking at this like as three prongs. You had privacy, you had security, and you were putting accessibility in as really important in prongs. I'm probably not saying that correctly, but um, do you, can, can you elaborate on that? Right, I uh, I have been on this um, on this bandwagon for a while. You know, I mean, everybody's talking about security, and people are be, uh, beginning to really focus on privacy. And I always said that this is actually a three-legged play, right? And you've got to have accessibility in there because um, to do again, going back to to do accessibility right, it has to be embedded into the organization. So privacy, security, and accessibility is all what I call the foundational capabilities. You really have to think about them as, as you build the foundation of your company, of your enterprise, or in, of your solution, or your software, your services. Um, and that you cannot afford just to think about each one of these foundational capabilities uh, in a silo. Uh, we have we're beginning to see evidence that, you know, in certain cases, uh, if you really want to maximize and, and have a kind of a strong um, uh, security um, uh, perspective, you might have to make some choices to dial down on accessibility, right? But on the other hand, if you have a, a solution or you have a um, application that's very user-centric and user-engaged, then you really have to dial up your accessibility and per perhaps dialing down a bit on security and privacy. Uh, I think we're moving to a, a very comp a lot more nuanced um, information technology world. It's not like I just lock you in or lo I lock you out. It's actually going to be the varying degree. So, so and on top of that, you know, you got to think about the privacy and accessibility inter interrelationship and actions. So I think you're going to see the whole risk management because all three parts, privacy, security, and accessibility, uh, do involve risk assessment uh, for companies. Uh, I see that kind of a more complex analytics actually begin to come in to balance all three. Yeah, great answer. Neil? Oh, thank you. So um, I, I can draw many analogies from the the work that you do, because obviously um, we have a governance function within our own organization, which I've, I've put a lot of heartfelt effort into get into place um, and can attest to the importance of having it and front ending it. It's really, really key to, to making it successful. How, how do you deal with the pushback? Because sometimes you were talking about the arbitrage between security and, and, and all of the other core elements, the, the three legs of the stool, as it were. Now, now often, um, 
you know, we're, we're customer-centric organizations. We're providing stuff that our customers want. How do you sometimes deal with, with the objections of, that, that customers will put in, in, in when you're saying, well, we want to deliver this? Um, and the accessibility is maybe not their primary concern, even though it's something that, that you very much want to do. Well, this is, I think this is everybody's challenge, right? And uh, I, I think it's just one of those situations that's where you have to have a, a team that's not just, not just very good at what they're doing. They have to be very passionate so they can be persistent. And they can press on regardless of all the negative, you know, uh, rejection. Um, I have to say, um, before this job uh, in IBM, and because I was in sales and marketing, I was, I was, you know, always looking. And usually in two, three years, you know, you get a handle of things, you can move on. And I've been at it almost, you know, a decade now. I'm still at it. And part of it is, is that it is a, uh, it is a very, very um, um, arduous process for people to really understand it because I think embedded in accessibility is not just a technology decision. There is a lot of a human feeling, right? Because you're, now you're dealing with a, yeah. with a real constituency like people with disabilities. So it's more complex. You know, you, 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 the pushback could be, could be technology based, could be facts based, and it could be emotion attitudinal based. Um, but on the other hand, I am an eternal optimist. I think um, in the end, because if you're in the in the even if you're in nonprofit, you know, it's all about making impact and 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 measurable and recognizable impact. I think accessibility with demographics uh, on our side, you talk about aging, um, with technology like mobile cloud on our side. Um, at least for me, I see more and more customers coming, actually the, the one, what we call the innovator uh, type of customers, recognizing the accessibility, not in the traditional compliance sense. So I, I do a lot in trying to make sure that I bring these kind of external customer um, uh, references in play internally. Let's face it, a lot of times when they see me showing up, they're like, oh, oh here comes the accessibility lady. <laughs> uh, but if I say, if I reference other customers, you know, what they're doing, you know, I was in Australia just uh, last uh, fall, all the big banks, all five of them, you know, is looking at accessibility, meeting with me by bringing their head of interactive experience. I mean, that is probably the hardest field, right? Interactive experience. Everybody's talking about customer engagement. Everybody's talking about experience. And the fact that there are banks, you know, recognizing that there is a um, convergence of accessibility, you know, as a, as a customer experience play, that just opened up a lot of, you know, eyes and ears. Um, so persistency, persistence and passion plus, you know, um, Keep an, always keep an eye on, on the what the customer is doing. I think helps. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think think that's true. We've all been in this for the long haul. Um, it, it's not right. a it's not a slow game. It's not a slow burn. Um, one of the other things that I'm, I'm doing is we are looking at ways of, of hooking into what the customer needs are. Looking at um, talking about customization uh, and and looking at how things right now are changing technologies, allowing people through APIs to do things through lots of different applications. So whereas we may have looked at accessibility as um, options within one application, now it's maybe a whole range of applications. So that brings me on to my next question for you, which is um, what are the sort of interesting applications that IBM are exploring at the moment in terms of accessibility and assistive tech? So we, we see the trend of accessibility, uh, not just the trend, we live it, right? I mean, if we really believe that accessibility is, is a, it's articulation of personalization, you know, of using technology to adapt to the individual's ability situationally, then that means that um, you gotta, you got to have accessibility built in, you know, a lot earlier in the development cycle. And that uh, historically, if you if you interview any CIO, when you say, okay, first you you want to know, do you know accessibility, right? If the answer is yes, 
and then you say, well, where do you do accessibility? How, you know, most answer would still be, well, I test accessibility, right, as a back end, you know, do the validation and testing. But we are moving very much into this, uh, into this uh, um, thinking and also begin to come up with the practices to say, you've got to have accessibility design in. I think mobile revolution really gave us the uh, ultimate uh, kind of a challenge and also opportunity, which says, you know, mobile apps, the life cycle of developing a mobile app is so short, right? I mean, we're talking about weeks now, not even months. And you don't have time to do over. You don't, you don't have time to say, oh, let me do this version that tested it, and then if it doesn't work, let me go back to do a testable version. So we've been uh, working with our IBM design team, for example, and uh, coming out with uh, first is best practice guidance uh, um, suggestions. Uh, we are in the IBM design uh, boot camp. What that means is that we are actually hiring thousands and thousands of new designers into IBM because we want to make the next generation IBM uh, solution and application more usable and consumable. Um, and then through the best practice of working of these uh, young designers, we actually beginning to codify the uh, the practices. And uh, once you codify it, you know we begin to come up with what we call the design based uh, tooling. Um, and again, to working at a large company like IBM, um, it's it, it, it's it's impossible just to dole out suggestions one at a time. You got to automate that kind of uh, best practices through tooling. So that's where our focus is, is, is been in the past, I would say, um, a couple of years is, for example, uh, really focusing on using mobile to create the best practice of codifying and design tooling um, and testing tooling and, and also try to build accessibility testing while you're doing development, not after development. Good point. Antonio, you had a question. Uh, yes, I do. Um, no, Francis. And uh, um, over, over, let's say, I, I, I think I can say this. You know, over the past year, we have the chance to travel around the world to meet uh, people from you know from different from different areas, different experiences. No, uh, today when we talk about digital, when we talk about we talk about accessibility, sometimes we tend to look that in a in, in a certain way. But when you travel and you meet all these people. Uh, from let's say from Europe to United States, from Australia, what differences can you identify there? Where are, are we all at the same level, or you see different areas, different countries, different industries moving at different speeds and different ways? Well, definitely moving at different speed, um, and Deborah Rue knows uh, we, or I, and along with uh, PJ Eddington from our government um, uh, program office in Washington, D.C., we have been very vocal about uh, our concern that um, the United States, even though as a country, uh, was the first one to set up the ADA policy, which really gener and then there also Section 508, uh, a procurement policy that, that really kind of a created the whole accessibility market, and that for, uh, for the past 25 years, we really enjoy kind of leadership play. But as I travel around, like, like you mentioned, um, I see, I see countries like Australia, the Commonwealth countries really are actually, lead, um, not leapfrogging, but their whole philosophy is a lot more sophisticated now. They, they actually see accessibility not as a compliance play, but as a, as a differentiation play. Okay. I see um, when you go to China, um, you see that the government actually uh, recognized the, the mobile, the power of mobile, and that the, the intrinsic principle of accessibility um, is very relevant for mobile design. So they see their country as a mobile country and therefore accessibility as a foundational requirement. I see, you know, countries like Japan uh, with aging population, um, they're looking at the nuances of design of uh, accessibility, not just for, you know, the 20-year-old, 30-year-old millennials, but, you know, the aging um, elderly, you know, with the losing uh, cognitive capabilities. And the accessibility definition in some of these countries 
uh, a lot broader now, and they are actually a lot more interested in, in extending the more historical uh, accessibility focus from blind to deaf, actually into uh, and also mobility into cognitive realm. So, so there is many different, actually different perspective and different uh, conversations now. Uh, than say just 10 years ago, where it's more focused on what I call the physical, for example, uh, uh, physical disability uh, uh, oriented accessibility technology. I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in cognitive disabilities and hidden disabilities, and, and I know that um, some of your team are actually co contributing to the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force. So be on a call with them and Deborah shortly after this. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity, actually, in, in terms of market size. You know, it's it's far far bigger than the the traditional accessibility um, cohort of, of of accessibility users, and the crossover between that and, and user experience in general and usability is is also much easier for um, UX designers to grasp. So I, I think that it, it, it's both an opportunity for us to expand accessibility, but also to um, look at ways that we can bring people into the fold. Because as you say, in, in organizations of, of IBM size, houses not that much smaller, we're 100,000 plus employees, um, can't you can't do it all yourself, so you're going to have to bring in people, you're going to have to have hub and spoke approach to, to be able to deliver this. And I think that that uh, the challenge of cognitive accessibility is one that, that we all need to step up to. Uh, I'm glad IBM are doing it. Um, and I know that Deborah wants to squeeze in one last point before, before we finish, so I'll, I'll, I'll say thank you and uh, hand you over to Deborah. Thank you, Neil. Uh, one thing, Francis and I um, served, we served on um, many boards and one of the boards we've both served on and Francis is still on the board is the USBLN board and I know that Francis and I both for many many years have been saying you know certainly you know you've got to blend it in at all levels but technology and the power of ICT to truly advance this um, it, it, we've been saying for so long haven't we Francis that there's such yeah. power in this and now we're actually seeing you know the evidence of it and so you know right. maybe maybe you could just as a parting words to our audience you know just um, speak about that for a second and then we look forward to doing the Twitter chat with you tomorrow but go ahead Francis well I, I think this is actually by far the most exciting uh, area I think the uh, with the technology like cloud and, and the mobile and uh, and cognitive computing coming to play it's all human centric and I think all of us who were the pioneer, and some people call us the warriors of accessibility. <laughs> I think we are. We have the responsibility to really uh, make sure that we we not only protect our our, our historic, you know, kind of understanding of accessibility from the uh, from the physical uh, disability side, but also ex be be very. Um, um, and be, be, be very brave to engage this very big, very unknown world of a cognitive. Uh, it's going to be yet another uh, brand new journey, uh, but uh, it's, it's, if we really can begin to address that, I think everybody, because I can't like aging, cognitive deterioration is, we're all going to have that. So with that, I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to uh, kind of uh, share my uh, share my mind. And uh, this has been a very cool and fun, uh, you know, uh, interview. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.